what are some things that you would really want to make sure that we talk about today that we want to leave people with? You know, I, I think that probably most important is for your listeners to, to understand that uh, you know, what the, the changes that my father's generation and my generation made in agriculture re really are fairly recent. You know, they started really uh, impacting post-World War II. Okay. And the changes were the industrialization, commoditization, and centralization of the food production system. Mm -hmm. and we can talk a lot about all three of those. They they were they they were they were <clears throat> super efficacious in achieving what they set out to achieve. It made okay. food cheap, abundant, and safe. Mm -hmm. Boring, but safe. Yeah, well, and, yeah, we'll call it that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Safe. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, but there were horrible unintended consequences. And that's what we're dealing with now. Okay. What would you say is probably one of the biggest unintended consequences? And we can start from there. Sure. So I think that that uh, the industrialization, the, the, the application of the factory model to the farm okay. uh, really had dire consequences on, with the environment. You know, we talk about carbon as though it's poison. And, you know, carbon is an element on the periodic chart. And it's been on, you know, it's, 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 it, there's, there's the same amount of carbon on the, in the, on the planet today as there was in the era of the dinosaurs. Sure. It's just, where is it? Yes. And carbon is meant to cycle. Gotcha. Carbon is, and, 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 and you know, and, and, and that's through photosynthesis in plants and respiration for us animals. And the, during the era of the dinosaurs, when all the cycles of nature were just operating beautifully, an enormous amount of carbon got sequestered, stored, locked uh, in, uh, under the surface of the earth. That's coal and gas and oil. And for the last 80 or so years, we've just been releasing it like crazy. Yeah. So, you know, why is it a surprise that it's out of balance? It's not, it should not be a surprise that's out of balance. Sure. And, and like you say, it's that we, that we being the, the government of the U.S. basically, there wasn't, I forget which uh, president it was, but he's, he stated we want to make food cheap. Um, and they've done that. But in the, you know, like you say, it's, it's through that process, though, that we've really, we've ruined our health, you know, and that's, that's, that's my wheelhouse where I, I talk about all the time. It's, it's what you're eating. Your food is your, the basis of you and talking about carbon I and mean, we're, we're carbon-based life forms, right? So carbon is, is an incredibly important thing. And these silly buying carbon credits and all that stuff is they're trying to <laughs> fix this situation is just absolutely asinine. When it really can come down to the farmer and how that farmer is farming his or her land. And like you mentioned, it's, it's, we're, we're releasing it so fast. What, how is it getting released so much faster today as a result of how we're raising our food? Well, there, there are several things. You know, I, I mentioned that all the fossil fuel that we have released, you know, when we burn fossil fuel, we release you know, a lot of carbon and, and other greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, and, and you know, I don't know if there's much we can do about that. Now, that Pandora is kind of out of the box. We can certainly curtail yeah. future uh, consumption, mm -hmm. but from the from an agricultural perspective, and what we can uh, do something about in this, starting now is a tremendous amount of carbon was, was stored in the soil, but not way down like the fossil fuel. It was, it was just stored in the topsoil. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the modern farming practices that we've used, modern being going back to pretty much World War II, mm -hmm. <clears throat> really releases a lot of that carbon. Okay. Uh, on, on my farm here, uh, through uh, using cultivation, uh, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, our car, so, uh, uh, organic matter in our soil was down to less than half a percent. Okay. Uh, 
over the last 20 years, we have gotten it up to 5%. So if you take 4.5% of the weight mm -hmm. of an acre of soil, which would be a couple million pounds of a six inch plow depth, that is a tremendous amount of carbon over a 3,200 acre farm. So you know, the farming properly not only does not contribute to climate change, it is maybe the most practical way to mitigate climate change. I tell you, the more I learn, I watched this movie called Kiss the Ground and it, uh, Ray Archuleta, this gentleman who works for, for our, the government, but goes out and teaches farmers how to change over. He talked about how much water is retained in the topsoil, and you had mentioned this, and then you had the, um, on the tour, there was the glass of this brown stuff, and then this more blackish kind of coffee ground looking stuff, and the difference was the brown stuff was just dirt. It's land that has been depleted of all the nutrients, all the carbon, the water, all the good stuff, the life, and then that that dirt contrasted with dirt from your your farm, which was amazing, and it was like smells good, and it just is you can you can feel the the warmth and and the life in it, and I thought that was really fascinating. So is that kind of what you're talking about, where that gets depleted out, and then you have to as a farmer or the typical farmer, they have to go add or amend that soil because it's been just mutilated there's no nothing good in it is that in, in my in my vocabulary dirt and soil are two different things totally. we oh, walk on you. both of them mm -hmm. but but soil is a living thing mm -hmm. it's a, it's a living organic medium that's teeming with life yeah. dirt is a dead mineral medium mineral medium and, Got it. Mm -hmm. and you know and it can be killed in many ways if you if you drive on soil enough with your vehicle, it will become dirt. It will, it will, it will crush all the, the life out of the soil. On a, on a bigger scale, if you use chemical fertilizers, pesticides, tillage, I rail about those three things a lot because they are, and, and, and all, of those, all three of those are products of technology. Sure. Chemical sure. fertilizer, pesticides, and tillage sure. are things that no species except humans can can do. We're so good at technology. Yes. And we're it's it's made that technology has made us powerful enough to kill the soil on huge expanses. Mm -hmm. And then when you want you to go to move from dirt to soil, you, so you got to quit using the three things that, that that got you there to start with. So. Yes. Yeah, and, and in our case, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, it's gone up four and a half percent. And you mentioned water retention, which is so important. Uh, an acre of land uh, will uh, uh, get when it gets one inch of rain. That's about twenty thousand gallons of water. Wow. Okay. And one percent organic matter will will absorb like a sponge. Okay. About 20,000 gallons of water. Okay, so one inch. So when my land had half an organic mile, yeah. I could absorb a half inch rain event. Gotcha. Now that it's over 5%, I can absorb a five inch rain event. And I'm in the Gulf Coast where we get 52 inches of rain a year. And five inch rain events are not, not uncommon. You will have two or three a year. Uh, so it's a matter of, A, you're absorbing that moisture to make it available for plants, microbes in the soil. Mm -hmm. But B, is avoiding that, that water running off, carrying topsoil, pesticides, chemical fertilizer, whatever else is in there. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's how we got the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. I think you're in yeah. Pensacola, aren't you? Yes, you know, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So the thriving... Uh, oyster yeah. uh, industry, oyster harvesting industry that we had there when I was growing up is in danger now. It so, is. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, I, I feel like it is almost exclusively due to what we've done to the soil in the basin here. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm 80 miles from the Gulf. I'm part of the basin that feeds the Gulf. Sure. Yeah, and that, that's really a critical part. And, and you had mentioned how the 
you know, the chemicals and the industrialization, how all, and then the pesticides, how all that started, the fertilizers. But is, if, if I'm correct, like, you know, World War II, we started building all, we had all these new factories, we started creating all these chemicals that were used for the war, but then the war ended. So what did we as America do? We said, well, we've got all these chemicals, where are we going to use them, right? And, and that, that's what brought these fertilizers and then the pesticides and those pesticides and, and the fertilizers, not the dead zone, but also that gets um, absorbed into our food, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. like either the plants or the animals that eat the plants. Yeah. yeah you're, you're exactly right. To flesh out a little bit, the, the, like, the history of it is very interesting to me because I was born in 1954. So the World War II was before my, my time, but and World War II uh, was such a game changer for agriculture. So, so much money was spent in developing technologies for war that when the war was over were easily convertible to uh, uh, repurposed uh, for, for, for tools of agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, you know, ammoniated fertilizer, the, like the, the, which you put on your lawn or golf course. I hope you don't put it on your lawn, but you might. Most people yeah. do. <laughs> The, uh, I think it was invented in the 1880s, something way before World War II. I'm not sure of the date. Okay. But it was so expensive, almost no farmers used it. The, the process was was in place, but it just wasn't a practical solution to feeding crops. Mm -hmm. World War II, uh, huge uh, ammunition plants were built. Mm. And when the war was over and they weren't needed to, to produce uh, ammunition, they could be converted over into ammoniated fertilizer plants. Mm -hmm. So uh, ammoniated fertilizer went from just being cost prohibitive to being really cheap. Gotcha. And when it's used initially, it's, it's like taking steroids. I mean, it, you, you crop, you, the plants just look fantastic. Mm -hmm. But the long term, it has unintended consequences that in the long term are destructive to the soil. Gotcha. Uh, I believe that uh, one of the first uh, pesticides was 2,4-D, which I think came from the uh, nerve gas research from the war. Mm -hmm. uh, we could go on and on with that, but even even, uh, even the, uh, you know, the the impact on the culture. So, you know, farmers had, had uh, farmed with uh, animals, mules, oxen pulling plows. When those farm boys went to the European theater and operated tanks. They didn't want to come back and farm with a mule anymore. You know, the demand for tractors, mechanized farming went way up. So on and on and on, it was just a real cultural shift. Uh, it, was, it was needed, you know, Europe was starving. There was a, 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 a incredible need for cheap, abundant food, and then we got it. You know, we, we got, uh, I would say, obscenely cheap and wastefully abundant food. But the unintended consequences fell on the land, the water, the environment, the rural community, yeah. and the welfare of the animals. And it was, a, it was a huge cost, incredible cost. It is. And I think, you know, we're at this point now where we've got to turn this massive ship around. And it, and it is, it, it's an overwhelming, and I, I think people, you know, they know enough and they think, oh, I just, I, I, I can't think of something more. Uh, you and I have talked about this, where we've just got so many things weighing on our hearts, weighing on our, our shoulders. You know, there's so many different issues happening. It's very hard for people to dial it back to, okay, well, the way I'm eating is promoting this problem. And the fact if, if they shift some of the way they spend their dollars, or as we often talk about, it's their, their voting ballot, if they, if they shift some of that, they can help make this a, a less cost prohibitive thing that can then promote farmers like you and your counterparts and your colleagues being able to build and rebuild a, a stronger earth, a stronger animal population, which in turn will build a stronger human population. You know, we've become just, we've spread out so much trying to silo each of these, you know, the way our food is produced. And honestly, Will, I mean, we talked about this, but the food that's on the shelves is not food. 
you know, there's, there's no food in that food. <laughs> there's no nourishment. If we dialed it back to eating some good, good meat, good, healthy, real plants, people's improve, their health would improve immensely. And we wouldn't need all that junk. You're, you're, I think your facts are right and your concerns are well placed. You know, I, I worry about it. You know, the, I believe that the country is uh, addicted to obscenely cheap food. And this is an addiction that will be very hard to move past. Yes. Uh, you know, the, I don't think our food is any more expensive than the obscenely cheap food I'm referring to. Yeah. But we have internalized those costs that have been externalized in that, that super efficient, efficient food system. Yeah. Now, uh, dial into that yeah. a little bit. What do you mean by externalized and internalized for the listeners, please? Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, my, my business uh, pays a huge, well, almost $700,000 a year in insurance. That's all the product liability, workers' comp, collision, property, whatnot. That number has increased uh, exponentially. I mean, from uh, like I can remember when it was a, a five-digit number. Mm -hmm. And it's because of uh, hurricanes and fires and tsunamis and all of these uh, uh, occurrences that have happened, mm -hmm. uh, I think, because of climate change. And that, so that, that's a cost, mm -hmm. but it's an externalized cost. It doesn't go into the cost of production when you, when you sit down, uh, you know, and I, I don't, I don't, you know, it's more your realm to talk about human health and that sort of thing. So I'll let, I'll let you do we that. Can <laughs> we, can talk we, re we refer you know, earlier to the dead zone in the in this, uh, what does that cost? That cost us all. Uh, the you know, you can all know about these costs that we've externalized, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and 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 you know those costs they, they've got to be paid somewhere. Yes. And uh, the, the most logical place to pay them and where it was uh, historically paid was at the actual exchange of the food for the, for the, for, for the compensation, for the monetization. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's two things. One is, and the, the, uh, the other uh, issue is, uh, I talk about seemingly cheap food being addicted to has been one problem for consumers. Yeah. The other one is the incredible amount of noise there is out there telling us that what probably isn't real good for us is real good for us. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the voice, the, uh, we call it greenwashing, uh, you know, huge multinational corporations spending uh, limited amounts of money mm -hmm. uh, telling consumers that what they're doing is the right thing to do. Uh, you and I discussed earlier how uh, I think that big food is where big tobacco was uh, today is where big tobacco was uh, in the 60s. Uh, in the 60s, I you mean, know, prior to that, people thought smoking cigarettes was fine. I mean, it was not, it was not stigmatized, wasn't considered to be a health issue. Right. Doctors were smoking in their offices while they were visiting with patients. So, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, you know, and I think that probably uh, big tobacco, I don't want this not, I think big tobacco did understand the dangers before anybody else did. They were the ones with the research. Oh, yeah. And they sat on it. You know, it was too much, too much money involved to, uh, to tell the truth. So they didn't. And ultimately, the, the word got out and uh, big tobacco got spanked. Mm -hmm. And and it, it it was a tremendous economic uh, spanking they took. Mm -hmm. So I think the big food is in exactly the same position today. I think that they know what they're doing much better than the rest of us know what they're doing. Absolutely. But I'm not sure they'll get the spanking that big tobacco got in the '60s because the the political system is so different. 
Yeah. Uh, today, there's so much money in politics that uh, I feel like it would take an egregious, egregious uh, uh, determination of the ills of big food will there be any meaningful legislation uh, or regulation for it? Yeah. So, so much money in politics. So I, uh, I see the similarities, but I also see a big difference. Sure. And I, I definitely hear that. And, and I think because of the, the cataclysmic amount of, of uh, com the complexity of it all, because there are so many layers, you know, this person is paid or this company is paid off by this company. And I, I think you and I talked about the revolving door between the USDA and the FDA and big food. And, you know, this guy or gal will sit on this board for a while, and then they're going to get into a, a position of power somewhere where they can, you know, create legislation or pass a bill or whatever it may be. And then they go back to get their cushy job as a CEO, CFO of some big food company that will be conglomerated and, you know, catabolized by another big company, which the challenge comes in when, when chemical companies are buying our food companies, y'all better be watching out because they have no desire for our health. They're looking to get their chemicals into more things. And that's, that's an absolute shame. And we talked a little bit about the soil health. Um, that food, that that food, and and I, I'm not going to use my finger quotes the whole time, or I'll get like carpal tunnel here because it's not food, <laughs> you know. But things that are passed off as food, they have all these chemicals in them, and those chemicals, same chemicals that kill that beautiful topsoil that you're talking about, are killing our guts, our gut micro microbes. You know, people are learning more about leaky gut and things to that effect, but there, these chemicals are going in and wreaking havoc. And we have so many consistent, like these chronic diseases that were never heard of before. Now they're becoming more and more common. We're looking at things like um, Alzheimer's. We're looking at the problem that we have with insulin in, in our, our bodies because of the, the food. It's just spiking insulin all day long. I could go on and on, which I will in another episode. Uh, but I wanted to kind of tie those together of the, the health of the soil that our food is, is grown in and then the animals that eat that, that plant or the fact that we eat those animals that have eaten that plant that was raised on that soil. Um, the one thing that you, you talk about, which I really love, I would love to, to give people this idea of how the, you know, your grass is, is grown and how the animals and the livestock add to the health of that grass and why we should be looking at eating grass-fed beef versus the stuff raised on a CAFO. Uh, maybe you could illuminate a little of the difference for them. I'd be happy to. Okay. <clears throat> so, so I mentioned uh, earlier that carbon mm -hmm. is not an, an evil, toxic substance. Carbon is an, is an element that cycles. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk a minute about the cycles of nature. Okay. So uh, when we, my father's generation and my generation, industrialized agriculture, mm -hmm. we took something that was very, very cyclical okay. and applied the linear factory farming model to it. Mm -hmm. In the interest of efficiency, yeah. we, we turned it into this linear system. Love and it. we were uh, somewhat successful in doing that uh, only by breaking the cycles of nature, which had horrible unintended consequences. Yep. Talked about carbon. So there is a, 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 to name a few of the cycles. And then I want to say that I believe there are cycles that we don't even recognize. We Absolutely. Just like, yeah. We can't even see that. But the ones that we can see are the carbon cycle, mm -hmm. the water cycle. So it rains, the water, if, if it's operating properly, is absorbed into the earth the way I mentioned earlier. Uh, it, it, it's evapotranspiration takes place, uh, the water cycle. Mm -hmm. There's a mineral cycle. You know, there are uh, uh, minerals in the ground, in the form of, uh, of stones. You know how lichens will, if you uh, uh, break down a boulder? Yeah, yeah. If you're on the microbial level, there are microbes in the earth breaking down stones, pulling minerals out of them. And they, we, we just learned this in, in recent years, 
those microbes exchange those positively charged minerals like potassium and phosphate and copper and iron to the plant for a little bit of carbohydrate. The, car the plant's making sugar yeah. through photosynthesis. It needs minerals. That microbe needs energy. So there's a symbiotic exchange that takes place. It's just beautiful. And that's, that's the mental cycle. That's you know, cool. There's the microbial cycle. Those microbes I just mentioned, you know, I went to the University of Georgia in the uh, 70s, majored in uh, animal science, mm -hmm. took all the soils courses that were available to undergrads, three of them, I think. Okay. And, and we talked about killing soil microbes all the time. That was the era in which germs cause sickness, illness, germs are bad, microbes are germs, we need to kill them. You don't want, you don't want microbes in your gut because they're germs, we need to sterilize your gut. So sure. that, yeah. And we're still, we're still of that mindset, but that breaks the microbial cycle that we so desperately need for things to work properly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a grazing cycle, plants, Plants are, the, the, the reason we're able to, to uh, sequester carbon is plants, particularly perennial plants, okay. breathe in greenhouse gases mm -hmm. through photosynthesis, turn them into sugar, pump them down into the roots, you know, and then and, and, and the animal uh, ruminant bites off the plant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those roots start to slough off. You know, we say if there's this much plant above the ground, there's this much plant below the ground. The animal bites it off, this sloughs off, yeah. that carbon is sequestered, captured yeah. down there. So that, that's part, you know, when, when I hear the research, the ludicrous research, the cattle are destroying the earth because they're putting up all these greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. Where the hell do you think that carbon came from? <laughs> it, was, it, it, was, it, it was all up there. Yeah. It brought down through photosynthesis. The animal bit it off. Some of it went back. There is flatulence. That, that does happen. And burping. Well, it's, burping a, and a small percentage. It happens. Right. Well, a small percentage goes back up. The rest of, right. you know, it's, it's so ludicrous. Yeah. But there are, there are so many other cycles of nature and the uh, difference in industrial farming and regenerative farming is a land management is mm -hmm. In regenerative land management, we endeavor to maximize the cycles of nature. Yeah. In industrial farming, and I've done it. I mean, I, I farmed industrial for 20 years before I changed up. You know, it was all about breaking the cycles of nature. Controlling. You know, we, yes, because we are we human, we must control nature. Yes. We, we looked for something to kill. We wanted a monoculture. We wanted only cotton or peanuts or corn or tomatoes or whatever we were growing and we want to kill everything else, which just flies in the face of, you know, monocultures don't exist in nature. Nope, she doesn't do that. <laughs> nature boils a monoculture. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Well, I love how you tied that very, you know, very closely and, and, and knit it really beautifully between the health of the soil again and the health of the human, the health of the animal and the health of the human. And one reason I think that you know we were we as a collective were looking for a scapegoat, so to speak, or a scape cow, was then why we decided that cows were bad was, was because we we do understand that the way that we've industrialized the raising of those animals for us to then eat or whether or have their dairy, it's a horrific scenario. It's it's horror, a horror show. And it's, it's completely unnatural. It's not okay for those animals to be raised that way. It's not okay for them to be slaughtered that way. It's not okay for the people that have those jobs to have to do that horrible work. So I, I, I know that people have, you know, people have a heart and people have a heart for animals and life in general. And when they've become so disconnected from how that food is is raised or and how those animals are raised or it becomes one of those well we just don't talk about that because it's just too painful i think that's that's why it's gotten so out of control in one way and and i would love for you to kind of illuminate again that difference between how how animals can be treated and how they they are 
they are allowed to express their animalness. If they're a chicken, they're allowed to be scratching and eating the bugs and, you know, eating the seeds and things like that. And then the, the cows are eating actual grass versus grain. They're not, you have, they have, what is it, five or six stomachs or something? Like there's a reason they have that long of a alimentary canal so that they can break down that grass and become this big, massive, gorgeous creature. Like maybe we could talk a little bit about just some of the nature. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. So, um, you know, I, I, again, I was an industrial cattleman. My, my father was the best cattleman I've ever known. I was an industrial cattleman for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I thought that the way I treated my livestock was just great and beautiful. And I had no qualms about it, no shame yeah. in it. And uh, I mean, if you'd said something bad about it, I probably would have spanked you for suggesting that. Yeah, you'd have to catch me yeah. well. I'm pretty fast. Watch out. Okay. All right. So uh, I don't, uh, you know, I, 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 there, there may be, I guess there are a few psychopaths in the oh, sure, animal sure. rearing business. You see those horrible videos are surreptitiously taken, but that's not the way, that's not the way most livestock producers are. Yeah. But they are uninformed, and and I was too. When I was raising cattle industrially, uh, I, 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 I was what I learned from my father and from the University of Georgia and from my peers is if you keep the animals well fed, mm -hmm. well watered, in a comfortable temperature range, mm -hmm. and you don't intentionally inflict pain and suffering on them, mm -hmm. you are good to go. And that's good. That's good animal husband. And it's fine. Okay. And we all believe that. But at a point, I came to realize that really that's not enough. Okay. Really, to have really good animal welfare, it's incumbent upon the producer to do those things I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Food, water, temperature, no, no, no intentional cruelty. But above that, it's incumbent that we provide the animal with the uh, ability to express instinctive behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, cows are meant to roam and graze, hogs are meant to root and wallow, chickens are meant to scratch and peck. Yes. That doesn't cross over. I mean, they, you know, they, what, what cows are meant to do, chickens are meant to do, hogs are meant to do, and we go down the list yeah. is unique or, or, or specific. Mm -hmm. And if we deprive them of those opportunities, uh, it, it puts them under stress, incredible stress, 24-7 for all of their lives. And that's, that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you have a, uh, if you believe that good child rearing means you take your child and put it in a closet. Sure where it's 72 degrees and you leave the light on and there's a mattress in there and you feed them and water them, you do whatever they want. You know, they, they'll never be abducted. They'll never break their leg on the football field. They'll never get in a fight out back. But it's not a good child rearing. And uh, so that, that, that was a, a big realization for me. And it's really, the, it was a canary in the coal mine for me of, of figuring out the what you know, questioning the other things I was doing. Okay, I hear that. That's a really good. Um, that's a good visual and a, a good parallel because, of course, we would never think that that's good for a human. But then, yes, absolutely, these animals when they can't express their their very nature and they're under all that stress, and then we end up either you know eating the egg from that animal or the dairy from that animal, and that's a whole other story of how dairy cows are kept. You know, and, and they're kept to, you know, increase their milk. But then if we eat that animal and we're, you know, depending how people believe, you know, whatever their, their spiritual beliefs, if you're eating an animal that has felt like it's been tortured or neglected or not able to, uh, you know, or under all this stress, that's going to be left in that, in that tissue and that, in that meat. And that animal, then when you eat that, you know, that energy gets exchanged. We're all just energy. Everything's energy, not the woo-woo energy, but like the really the scientific energy. And if, if we continue to consume that, that, that has something to do with it too. And the chemicals like the cortisol that that animal who's been under stress 
it's got that coursing through its body, then we take that in and then, you know, our body has to deal with it. So it's, it's fascinating to see. And I love how you talked about the, uh, the linear versus the cyclical systems. Nature is cyclical. Everything, we're cyclical. Everything in us is cyclical. And there's reasons, you know, to eat food that is in season and why that would be better. And I, I love how you brought in the, the mineral cycle and how those microbes are breaking that down. There's going to be certain uh, times of the year that activity is higher. So maybe that's getting more minerals into certain types of plants that we then might ideally eat. It's just amazing. I think what I, well, what I hope people are being left with that at this point even is that everything is cyclical and it's not us versus nature, which is where, like you talked about, like we're, you know, trying to kill all these things off and, and control it. We are nature. <laughs> no matter how amazing, you know, we as humans are and we're, yeah, top of the food chain, but look what we're doing at the top of the food chain. We're ruining the food chain. You know, maybe we're, maybe we're not the best stewards of the food chain, right? Yeah, maybe we're the worst. So, yeah. so let's talk about cyclical just a minute. Yeah, you, uh, please. Uh, so uh, we, we practice steady and practice holistic land management. Yeah, I love it. And the, the, the first step in understanding that is to understand the difference between a complex system okay. and a complicated system. Mm. So this computer that we're talking on is a very uh, uh, complicated system. Mm. Your body is a very complex system. Gotcha. In both, both of them, there's a lot of stuff going on to make it work. Yeah. But in a complicated system like this computer, if one component fails, it won't work anymore. It'll sure. just stop working. In a complex system like your body or my farm, if one component, a lot of stuff going on to make it work. And if one component ceases to, to function, everything will morph. It'll continue to operate. So reductionist science which is super linear, yes. is fantastic on complicated systems. I mean, that's how, who the hell would have thought we could talk on this thing? <laughs> right. It's just the, the, the incredible power and magic of linear reductionist science. Reduction science does not work well on complex systems like my farm or your body. Yes, sir. It, it, it leaves unintended consequences, you know, because of this, this morphing that things do. Uh, when we applied reductionist science, the linear model to a comp complex system like the farm, we wound up with all those unintended consequences. Yeah. And, and we did it in an effort to make it linear because that can be scaled up and efficient. Mm -hmm. We gave up the cyclical systems that give us resilience. Yes. So we traded, we as a society, mm -hmm. traded efficiency for resilience. And we all appreciate efficiency, but efficiency can be overdone. And you know, you remember how in the uh, in the Great Recession. Uh, 2008, they talked about big companies like AIG being too big to fail. Yes. See, I think that we have, have linearly scaled up agriculture, food production, where it's too big to not fail. Mm. It, it just, it just, it, we gave, we just kept giving up more and more and more resiliency to get more and more scale, to get more and more efficiency. Mm. And at some point, it breaks down. Yeah. And during the pandemic, uh, I'm kind of a news junkie. I was, I was drinking my coffee and putting on my boots one morning mm -hmm. during the panic of the of the pandemic. Yeah. And the CNN headline said uh, the CEO of Tyson Meat Company said the food system is breaking. Yes, I remember that. And you know what? You know what? He was right. Mm -hmm. it, it was breaking. Now, you know it. It the the pandemic, the panic part of the pandemic came under control before it completely broke down. But for the first time, for me at least, we saw the beginnings of the breakdown. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can see that. And, and well, 
and this might be a little, it's not a well thought out um, thought, but sometimes things need to break down so we can rebuild them, right? Or so we can build them back up. And I, I think because we've centralized our food so much, not only the production of it, or the, well, the growing of it, but the production of it. And now we're, you know, we're cutting down rainforests left and right. We're cutting down all these, these, you know, beautiful, pristine lands to grow these crops like more sugar and some of the, you know, the, for the oils, for canola and things to that effect. So we're just ruining the land even further not just to produce, you know, not to produce meat even. I mean, we're, we're mostly talking about meat, but where do the, the grains that we feed the animals in these CAFOs, where do those come from, right? So it's like this, this whole, the, the more we're trying to control nature, the more we're having to break from these beautiful natural cycles, and the more that's going to, you know, not only break down what's happening outside of ourselves, but what's happening to us. And, and I think we, you know, we've lost so much, sight of the fact that it's it's our it's humanity as a whole like our future is at stake here not just our planet but our future if we can't feed our people what are we going to do yeah the, uh, the way i state that is if you realize you're on the wrong road the answer is not travel faster and faster, faster. That the answer, <laughs> answer is not another road right so, i think i think that's kind of where we are yeah, yeah. And then, you know, that comes in back into that question or that uh, thing you brought up about the policy, the food food policy. You know, like every five years, a bunch of scientists or, or people who are, um, you know, deemed worthy of, of making our nutrition policy get together and they come up with their consensus and they post that. And, you know, that's where fat is, you know, fat became our nemesis and cholesterol, of course, that's, you know, public enemy number one and two when it comes to our diet. But part of that was all fueled by the politics of food and the fact that if you take fats out of, out of what's naturally found in a plant, because plants have, have oils as well, but if you take that out, it makes it more shelf stable. So now we're talking about doing some of this craziness when I will go on the record saying it's craziness with plant-based meat type things. You know, so we're trying to make a meat type of food like, the, the, like these burgers now that are made out of plant-based material but that is such highly processed food that even if whatever it started out as could be somewhat nutritious, by the time it's processed, there's no nutrition in it. So um, one thing I learned a few years ago, and I told you about my, my experience of buying meat off the shelf and how when I cut it open, it was gray inside, but it was red on the outside. And that just kind of being a science nerd, I thought, well, that, that's weird. Why is it, why, what's going on there? So I started researching and learned what can be done to our store-bought, shelf-bought um, meat. Can you can you share a little bit what's different about like what you guys do at White Oak Pastures and what might typically happen to our meat, and where that might uh, might break down our our health further? I'll go into that part. Yeah, there's a lot we can say about that, and I guess that gets back to the centralization. Yes. We talked about industrialization centralization and commoditization. And we've been talking about industrialization. This moves into centralization. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> there was a time when uh, pretty much every agricultural county in the, in the country had a little abattoir or slaughterhouse mm -hmm. that, that, that provided for the community. And uh, there's a what was very, very, uh, what became very obvious uh, as a problem with that is it could be done so much cheaper mm -hmm. by scaling it up, by centralizing. Sure. So fast forward to today, there are very, very, very few small abattoirs, slaughterhouses out in the country. Okay. When I built my first one in 2007, mm -hmm. there were only two on farm, farmer owned uh, slaughterhouses in the country. Uh, us, okay. one in California. Wow. Okay. Farmer, on farm, farmer owned. Yeah. Wow. All right. And the numbers had declined so dramatically because these huge mega slaughterhouses were built. And I'll give you a perspective on size. Mm -hmm. uh, our own farm slaughterhouse slaughters about a hundred cows a week. 
Okay. A hundred cows a week. Mm -hmm. Hold on to that for a second. Mm -hmm. A big industrial slaughterhouse may slaughter four thousand head per hour. Oh, what? How? So, wow. So that, you know, just, just get you know, we, yeah. we, we, so that that, that <laughs> brain spinning. Okay. I'm sorry, 400 hit per hour. I misspoke. 400 okay. hit per oh, hour. Wow. Okay. We slaughter, we slaughter, we slaughter 100 hit per week. Okay. So when uh, that 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 level of industrialization brings in such incredible efficiency that it costs us uh, almost $500 a head to process an animal. That's, okay. you know, that's the total cost in a big industrial plant can do it for less than 100 hit. Hundred dollars per head. Okay. It was incredibly efficient. Yes. But then it has uh, it has horrible unintended consequences. There we are with that unintended consequences before. In terms of what it does to the community where they build those plants with the wastewater and waste products, you know what it does to the labor pool. Those jobs are not real desirable. You wound up with some terrible infrastructure situations with regard to the human resource. Uh, the animal welfare, of course, is, is we, we could talk about that all day, but it's really horrible in that kind of situation. So again, we're, we're trading uh, a lot, we're, we're, we're taking a lot of cost and, and externalizing. Got it. But those costs are still there. It's just they're not being born in the cost of the meat itself. Got it. Yep. I gotcha. And and then, you know, our government is subsidizing things. So we subsidize the feed for these animals. And do we subsidize beef? Beef is primarily, yeah, yes, there are subsidies in beef, but not, uh, they're mostly indirect. Yeah. Not subsidizing the feed for the yeah. beef. But there's some, there are some, there are some subsidies, but uh, the, the, the heavily subsidized crops are more the, the row crops. Okay. Yeah. So and, and interestingly, uh, Sugar is one of the most heavily subsidized crops. You know, yeah. it's just it's, it's been interesting to me how we have meatless Monday, mm -hmm. but we don't have sugarless Saturday. No, we don't. <laughs> and sugar is so cheap. I mean, when you when you go to Starbucks, the sugar's free. Yes, it's right. Just right there. Help right. yourself. Get all you want. Please. Let's talk about, it's let's talk about sugar. Yeah. We talk about the adverse health effects of beef, and they're arguable. The adverse health effects of sugar are not arguable. Mm -hmm. You know, people people knew 200 years ago that it rotted your teeth out. And of course, now they know more and more. We know more and more, and more about what it did. From an uh, environmental perspective, I don't think there's much any worse than sugar production. From a uh, human uh, labor impact perspective, you know, it's certainly not pretty. No. You know, there's just not much good about sugar. No. But it's not villainized nearly as much as meat. No, no, not at all. And fat, yeah. And, <laughs> and, it's, and it's heavily subsidized by the government, by taxpayers. So, you know, I don't think it I don't think it's a coincidence that the uh, the flawed research showing how cows are destroying the earth has been so hyped that everybody's heard it. I yeah. mean, you, you may or may not believe it, but there's no one that hadn't been exposed yeah. to meat is murder. Yeah. And uh, meat is going to, uh, cattle is destroying the, the, the environment. Uh, but, but sugar is fine. I mean, sugar is fine. And I think that this, this, this militant uh, vegan agenda so let's let's talk just one second about vegetarians and vegans. <laughs> so so I, I fully respect the vegetarian or vegan lifestyle choice. Yeah. Come on, you get to decide what you eat. It's your choice. You should absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when someone tells me they're vegetarian or vegan because uh, they just can't bear the uh, the thought of eating so an animal that's lived, I get it, and that's fine. Okay. That 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 the uh, the mouth feel is yucky. I get it. That's fine. Yeah. But I'm not going to let you tell me that it's because meat properly raised is destroying the earth. I reject that. 
that's not okay. That's not a reasonable read. Mm -hmm. So the difference in a vegetarian vegan is they have decided for themselves what they want to eat. Yeah. A militant vegan has decided what all of us are going to eat. Yes. And that's not okay. That is unacceptable. You, you, you can't make that decision for me. So I think that the incredible uh, uh, information sharing about this bad science is probably financed by somebody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, follow the money trail always. Oh, yeah. So uh, we, we can talk about that. We can talk about that quite a lot. But. Yeah, yes. Well, and, and I'm glad you brought this up. And, and I'll often hear, because I, I definitely am a proponent of a meat-based diet and meat in, in science, I mean, meat is basically the animal was the processing for the plants. So in essence, you get the nutrients from those plants, which ideally are good plants, like what you have at, at White Oak. Um, those, that good nutrient or that nutrient, um, like the, the profile basically. So all these minerals and everything should be in that meat if it's been able to eat what it naturally was designed to eat. And if that, that plant was designed, was, uh, basically grown the way it was designed to be grown. And I say the word design because the design's there, the blueprint for life is incredible and it's very intricate. And it is very complex. And when things are, are done in according to that design, that results in these wonderful, healthy humans. I mean, you look at some indigenous populations now that haven't been you know, ruined by, by us, which there's only a few. And you look at these amazing, healthy bodies, their bones are strong, their teeth are straight and, and beautiful. They have great hair. Like these are healthy human specimens. And then we look at our human population, especially in this country where, you know, chemicals abound everywhere. Processed food is the majority of people's diet and folks diet is just whatever you're eating. Whatever, that's, that's your diet. It's not going on a diet. But when we eat all this sugar, it's keeping our, our chemistry so out of whack. And you, you illuminated it beautifully earlier where because we're complex, our body can adapt but our body can only adapt so far. There's a point, there's a reason we have so much type two diabetes and why it's no longer adult onset. We now have children, we have babies who are practically insulin resistant because of the way their mothers ate, not knowing they didn't do it on purpose, but our food has been so hijacked and the chemicals, some of the best chemical engineers on the planet are working for big food. So they know how to get that chemical profile to make your gut tell your brain, I want more of that. <laughs> and it is unbelievable the concoctions that they come up with. But we, we as a collective allow that because we don't hold our politicians responsible. We don't say, hey, no more of that crap in our food. You know, we, we refuse to do that. We refuse to let you. We just continue to let them because it's cheap. And then unfortunately, those who are on, on subsidies from our government for their very food, all that food is, is junk. So you can have somebody who is severely overweight and you think, oh my gosh, they're well-fed. No, they've, they've eaten, <laughs> but they're not nourished. And you know, so there's such a, a, deep, um, a deep wound going on in, in, with our food. And it's not just about calories. You know, that's why I think we, we industrialize food because we mistakenly at that point thought it was just about getting more calories into people. It's not the calories. It's, it's the quality of nutrients that come from the food. And I will tell you this, and I'll go science for science with anybody on it. Meat, when properly grown, is the most nutritious pound for pound um, food that you can eat. So if, you know, I get people say to me, well, you know, Dr. Sam, I don't think that, that, you know, I don't want to eat meat because it's not good for you. And then I say, okay, how much time do we have? Where do we want to go? <laughs> how much, how much science do we want to get into? Because actually it's the most healthy food for you. Um, mm -hmm. Not every meat, but, you know, beef in and of itself when raised like you guys raise it. Oh my goodness. You could sustain on it solely. So let's talk about that nutrient balance a minute. I think that's, that's a very good point you made. And it's part of those cycles we keep going back to that when, when minerals are cycling properly and nitrogen is a nitrogen cycle and cycling uh, optimally, 
there's only going to be so much of each individual element in the soil. There's a, there's a saturation point. It's just not going to be beyond that saturation point. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to the application of mined minerals like potassium and phosphate and the ammonification, we can put copious quantities of nitrogen down. Okay. And plants are kind of like us. They will luxury consume. <laughs> I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> they will, they will. Uh, if, but if, nice. If, uh -huh. if, if, if potassium is there within a normal range, uh -huh. they're going to get so much of it and, and, and grow and, and go reproductive and be fine. Okay. But if there's an abnormal amount of it there because we mined it in New Mexico and put it on a train and brought it to Bluffton, Georgia and put it out there, mm -hmm. they'll absorb more than that. Okay. So when that, that's luxury, luxury uh, consumption. So the, the mineral balance in that plant is improper. So when the animal, the cow, or the, it's, uh, the grain, the hog, or chicken mm -hmm. uh, assimilates that, then they're out of balance. And, and you can have some real, you know, there's, a, a, there's a, a situation called nitrate poisoning that occurs in cattle because they eat plants that absorb too much nitrogen and it's in the form of nitrate. And we can go on and on. There's a thing called grass technique that uh, where the magnesium calcium is out of balance. Okay, yeah. Uh, milk fever, it was called many years ago. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are other things. So we, we're part, we practice, I mentioned earlier, holistic land management. Mm -hmm. We talk about birth, growth, death, decay, birth, growth, death, decay, a cycle, back on cycles. That's another cycle that we can bring into the equation. Yeah. And it brings to my mind that every, everything that lives, me and you and mosquitoes and sequoias, mm -hmm. everything that lives will die, has died or will die. Right. Everything that any living creature consumes for nutrition was a living thing. Absolutely. And in a healthy ecosystem, nothing stays dead for long because it's, it's recycled back. So. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, this is, this is really, really great. And I hope people are kind of getting this idea that it's, it's when nature is allowed to be nature, nature has it has it figured out you know this 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 whole cycle of of life is is what has to happen like we can't we can't opt out of that <laughs> there's no little checkbox on our you know dmb um, application that says oh i'm checking out of i'm opting out of nature you, we have to be part of that natural system and in in my humble opinion I am not going to wait for my government or any government or any policymakers to tell me what I can and can't do. And I, I certainly don't default to that now, but I'm not waiting for them to rescue me. I'm not waiting for them to, um, you know, pass some law or some new policy that's going to improve our nutrition as a, as a collective. It's up to me to make my best choice with my dollar and my fork. And I think that's what people are, are starting to realize that they do have more power than they think. And that power comes in their own household. I can't control what the, you know, what's going to happen or what's on the shelves at my grocery store, but I can certainly find people like you and, and Jenny and I will be talking next week um, more about, you know, what, what your whole process is there for the, you know, how marketing, um, you know, marketing with the ideas and the food and the quality of the food and, all of those things, how we've been kind of hoodwinked as a society on thinking that the food that we are purchasing is actually healthy and happy animals and cage free and free range and you know all those terms, because those are other ways that we're mistakenly led down that path just faster, <laughs> the wrong path. But it's it's a it's fascinating. But is there anything that like that we've talked about that you think we should kind of bring back full circle before we um, end our episode? Oh, well, we've talked about so much. I've gotten lost in it. Just it's good. Bit. I love it. 
<laughs> and that's the fun part. And, and like, so that's why I wanted to do this in this format of just kind of, you know, give us some ideas to, to follow, but for people to really see how this is all interconnected. We as, as human beings, we are interconnected. You know, we're taught that you should be independent and that's great and all. And it's, it's wonderful to, you know, be self-sufficient, but we're really not, especially when it comes to our food. We need to have farmers that are doing things like Will and his team. We need to have a, a collective of farmers and more farmers being asked, you know, hey, are, do you have grass-fed beef? And if they say yes, great, support that. Because um, I think that Will did a great idea or a great deal of, um, you know, di diving deeper into why grass-fed is, is healthier. And, you know, I'll go into that over and over with people on this podcast, but it's up to us to make the decision and to buy it and to support people like Will. Is there, um, are there multiple farms that are doing things like you or are we, are we seeing a nice a shift as far yeah, as- there are. I'm glad you brought that up. There are. We're certainly not the only people in the country doing it. I've got yeah. some really good friends uh, across the country. Uh, you know, to, to name, name a few, a guy named Greg Gunthorpe in Indiana, a guy named uh, Spencer Smith in Nevada. I, I can go down a, a list of them. But sadly, there aren't nearly enough. Sure. And Is there something the, consumers can do, though? Like if, if, if a consumer in their own little nexus or their neighborhood or their, you know, farming collective, can they, can they help support that? Or let oh, there's, there's any, uh, the, the only way, uh, the only way this uh, sort of animal management, land management, rural development can exist will be from the support of consumers. It, it won't, as you point out, it won't be through regulation or government subsidy or laws or big food companies suddenly changing. It'll, it's, it's purely in the hands of the consumer. Mm -hmm. And, and sadly, uh, I've seen it go the other way in recent years. I mean, when I started this up a long time ago, uh, uh, the big big food companies had not focused on this niche. Mm. So okay. we kind of had it to ourselves a little bit. And I don't just mean white oak pastures, I mean we farmers. Sure. Uh, about 2015, there was a shift, and it's just like, the big food company said, you know, this, this niche is probably worth exploiting. And they did, and they're very good at it. Yeah. And I don't know that I could have uh, made the transition today that I made 20 years ago because of the noise out there with the big food companies. So it, it, it's, uh, uh, we talked about how this model is not highly scalable. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I think that that's right. I think that White Oak Pass is probably scaled up about as big as we need to be. Sure. Probably don't need to grow anymore. Yeah, I hear that. Uh, but it's highly replicatable, and there should be a White Oak Pastures in every county, in every agricultural that. county in the country. Yeah. And that can only happen if consumers decide to make it happen. And it's very hard for consumers to do that. You know, there's... Uh, I, I wish I could tell you there's a, 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 a link, a website you could go to and find somebody in your zip code that would just do a great job. That's not there. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's not out there. Sure. If, if we had one, it'd be corrupted mm. very quickly. Okay. So it, it, it takes some work on the part of the consumer mm -hmm. to figure out who to support. You know, right now, we ship product to 48 states through UPS and FedEx and I appreciate the business I need it thank you mm -hmm. but really that's not the way I want it to be long term yeah really uh, I want to produce the same amount of product we're selling now and sell it you know, in Georgia Florida Alabama and yeah. then I want somebody else doing it somewhere else somebody else doing something and I hope that in time the people like us do the same amount of business in a smaller and smaller and smaller geography I hear to the that. point that we are serving our own community. Right. right now, if I had to run this business, I have 180 employees. We sell $20 million worth of product a year. 
if I had to depend on my local 10 zip codes or 20 zip codes, I couldn't do it. There's not enough volume there to pay my people every Friday. Right. But There's I not hope enough that, volume of, of desire for that food, but I bet people are eating enough beef conventionally grown. To okay. it, right? Correct. Good yeah. point. That's, that's, that's it. If, 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 the, uh, if, if, we, if we were feeding a, a bigger percentage of the people that are eating industrial beef, yeah. then we, we could do it on a very small area. Sure. Uh, I've done the math. And on if uh, 20, 20 million dollars a year, uh, if we sold, if we had sixteen thousand customers, okay. not families, customers, individuals, okay. that they only our product, mm. that'd, be, that'd be all we need. Well, sixteen thousand people is not even a big city. That's a that's a that's a, mm. a small city. Yeah. So, and, and you know, I know it's impractical to say that, that 100% would come from us, but I'm just showing you it doesn't take many consumers to support a system like this. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought it into that um, and, and really gave some concrete numbers because I, I think that's that's the key for everything is having it more localized and then having people build a community together where they're interdependent you know, I, I, as much as I love farming and I've got a decent green thumb, I, it would not be my best use of, of my skills and, and my time and my investment for me to go out and start my own farm. I'd rather support someone like you and I do, and I, we're continuing. And I'm like an evangelist now. All my friends are like, Sam, you, you really, you, you really love these guys, don't you? I say, yeah, you know, I went there. I saw it for myself. I met the people. You have one of the happiest teams of people. And I love your policy and I'll let you say it if you want to say it, but there's, you know, he has a specific policy where people, he wants a happy team who are very educated. They all speak in the us, they, like they say, well, we started in, in 1866 and we did this and we've had this many things and we do this much volume. They're a very, we, not, not the company, you know, whereas some, some larger companies, it's all about the company and the corporate value and the corporate brand. These people are all bought in with Will, and, and it's not like everything is all about Will either, folks. It's it's about the the animals and the animals being happy, and that makes happier humans. And I think if we saw that, that could revitalize some of these rural communities. You know, you talk in, in your um, movie, which I will have linked in here, 100,000 Heartbeats, what has happened to the rural communities and how terrible that is. And we're, we're, you know, bringing all these people into these large, big cities. And, and there's the same stuff that happens to the animals in those large, or, uh, large CAFOs happens to humans. Humans aren't meant to be, you know, amongst all these other humans all the time. That's not natural. Yeah, that, that, that's a, that, that, that is an interesting point that, 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 really surprised me, you know, the three basic tenets of white oak pastures is, you know, high animal welfare, yeah. regener regenerative land management, mm -hmm. and rebuilding this local community. Yeah. And that's, that's the only three things we think we do well is all we talk about yeah. in terms of uh, bragging on our product or our system. Yeah. But what's interesting to me is the first two that I mentioned were just super intentional. You know, I was operating on a fairly large scale. I was very happy with it. I became less and less happy with it. I, I wanted to quit going down that road faster and faster and get on another road. So I very intentionally studied what, what I was doing with my animals and land and what uh, other options were out there and intentionally made changes and some worked, some didn't, the ones didn't work. I intentionally made other changes until we got, got it to a point that I, really, I was satisfied with it. Now, the third one, the rural development uh, was unintentional. I never, you know, I had watched this town and other towns dry up all my life. Yeah. And never would have dreamt that it was reversible. Mm. And certainly never would have dreamt that we could contribute to reversing it. Love it. But when we changed the 
the way we managed the land and the animals, we needed more people. So we brought in these young, for the most part, talented, mm -hmm. passionate people. And they needed a place to eat and drink and sleep and play and live and shop. So we built it for them. Yeah. And, and now we got a nice little town. I mean, this has gone from a ghost town, quite literally, mm. to a nice little destination, still very small, but kind of just very pleasant. Yeah. And it was it was absolutely unintentional. And what I realized is the industrial centralized model rendered rural America irrelevant. It yeah. just wasn't yeah. needed anymore. There was no conspiracy theory to dry up rural America. It just, it just atrophied because nobody needed it. Mm. And when it became uh, important again, relevant, it built back up very, very uh, uh, unintentionally. Sure. <laughs> I hear that. It, and that's, a, that's a, a theme in your, in your cycle and in your story as an entrepreneur. And, and you're really a quintessential entrepreneur because you saw that there was a need for a little shop. Okay, well, let's, let's revamp this, this shop and let's make it happen. And it's got, they've got this huge cat, uh, like a counter and they've got multiple people working back there. You guys sell all sorts of products, which I'll go through with Jenny. Um, but you've got this great cafe and the food is so good and it's just good it's just good, healthy food. Like it's, it's got life in it, which is so strange to, to say about, you know, food, but that's, that's the really, that's the thing. If, if you're going to eat something, ideally that food was recently alive and ideally that food has taste. Like I had the, um, the burger salad, that burger was so incredibly tasty and it has just some salt and pepper on it. You know, a lot of beef, the reason you have to season the heck out of it is because it has no taste. A lot of the, the typical beef in the stores, the this grass-fed, grass-finished, which is a whole other topic, that that is tasty. It has texture and, I mean, it's just it's amazing. And the greens were all really yummy. I didn't even really need any salad dressing, which I don't normally use anyway, <laughs> but it was so good. Yeah. I'm smiling because you referred to me as an entrepreneur, and my daddy said that entrepreneur is a French word for dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will happily be a dumbass any day because I love being an entrepreneur. <laughs> because entrepreneurs, they solve problems, right? If you solve a problem that enough people have, you will be rewarded. And your reward is, you know, being able to do good work, doing good work that, that makes you want to get out of the out of bed every day. You know, that's that's the reward for us when we are solving issues and, and bringing a solution to the table. And you serve as a model for other people to be able to come. Um, and they can come and, and they can uh, do a tour. They could hang out with you. I literally sat in Will's Jeep and we cruised around and, and checked out the, the pastures and it was He's just re really accessible to everybody. Um, you eat lunch every day at the general store, from what I understand. I eat three meals a day there, seven days a week. Really? I love it. <laughs> well, we're coming back up in August, and I'll, I'll put links down here to White Oak Pastures for everybody. But in August, uh, I believe it's the 21st, they're going to have a concert. So I would love for, for people to, to go and, and just um, you know, get to experience this yourself. It's not on a major highway, but it's not a far from the major highways. If you're going anywhere through Georgia, be sure to put Bluffton on your um, on your radar. Whether it's raining or or shining out, it's uh, they're going to be opened because they're they've got animals and they're doing their thing, and the people can each of them can share the story. Even if you don't get to see Will on that day, you'll you'll hear the story direct from folks who are living it. And I, I encourage you to also look at their website and see they've got a like a beef package that's just a couple um, steaks and a couple fillets and then some ground beef. That's a great way to start. And really, um, like my, my friends and I, we did a, a taste test. So we had a conventionally grown uh, pound of ground beef and then a pound of, of Will's ground beef. No question. And just a little salt and pepper on them. 
even just looking at them, like in the store, you can see the different color. Um, White Oak Pastures does have their meat in Publix if you're in Florida. We found some. I was so happy you told us about it. <laughs> uh, so that was awesome. But it, you can see the difference. You can taste the difference. You can smell the difference because typical beef is washed with all sorts of chemicals because they have to. It's not as, um, not as clean or not well. I know everything's USDA uh, monitored, but the typical CAFO meat has to go through so much more of a processing um, process versus you guys. I mean, you've got a, a very efficient system and it shows in the end product, not only how it tastes, but definitely what it does inside of us as humans. Um, so I, I think you're you're doing such great work and I look so so forward to continuing our friendship and conversations and definitely coming up and visiting with you all again. Yeah, yeah, well, I do appreciate being on your show today.